purpose of this short lecture is to help students get their mind around the readings, what their intent is, and what they should get out of those readings as they prepare them uh, for the exam. You may have noticed that the readings fall into um, several different categories. Some are case briefs that take uh, cases and give you the facts, uh, go ahead and tell you the issue at hand in the case, uh, the court's reasoning, and the court's decision in that case. Other readings are uh, actually transcriptions of oral arguments before the court, the Supreme Court, as uh, in, the, in most cases the Supreme Court. Uh, and the purpose of those is to show you exactly what goes on before the Supreme Court as arguments are made, uh, trying to convince the court that the co uh, court should uh, act in one way or another in a given case, given the circumstances of that case. Finally, you're going to come across readings that are more academic in nature and analyze a particular area of law or a way in which that an area of law has uh, traditionally been applied. So overall, the hope is that as you read various types of readings covering a, a number of different approaches uh, to justice and in several different areas, whether it's patents or whether it's criminal law uh, or the like, that uh, crimes by their very nature can appear in any number of, of places. And even though in some of the instances we're really talking about torts, it gives you an understanding, an insight into the mind of the system, if you will, this justice system. Uh, and the one thing you should get out of that, of course, is that the system is designed not to uh, mete out fairness. That is very difficult to do, as I've said before. But to uh, mete out justice, which means a consistent way in which we apply uh, the law. Oftentimes, when the law is applied, people think, well, the decision of the court is not fair. But fairness is very difficult to define, as I've said, and more importantly, it's very difficult to adjudicate. That being said, I just want to look at a few examples, three in total, uh, that will give you some sense of what you should expect to get out of each so that you can be better prepared for the upcoming final exam. First, let me talk about uh, the case briefs. There, it's pretty straightforward. What I'm expecting you to know is the name of the case, the issue in that case, the court's reasoning, so you understand how the court came to their decision, of course, the court's decision. So if you have a proper brief of the case, which you can pick up online, you'll be able to give answers to those questions uh, you know, fairly straight, in a fairly straightforward manner. That is to say, those particular types of questions should be relatively easy to answer. It, they're designed just to see if you understand what you've read and not necessarily delving very deeply into the, into the case uh, as, it, as it developed. First, I want to br uh, very briefly look at the uh, Brumfield case. Here you have a situation where um, someone um, kills a police officer and then after the fact, after it's gone through the entire system of the state, in this case Louisiana, there's an appeal made that the person that was convicted is not mentally competent. And so the issue here is what exactly determines mental competency and where should that determination be made? As you'll see or have seen with the case, the court is very clear that that is the decision that is made on the state level. That is, the state decides what constitutes um, someone's ability to really uh, be responsible, or the, I'm sorry, not their ability, but whether or not they can be responsible for their actions. And so that means that several things would have to be defined, yes, in order for us to understand exactly how Louisiana or any other state goes about making uh, the very important determination uh, about someone's mental competence. Keep in mind that the way these things are defined, mental competence is defined, can vary from state to state. So even in a Supreme Court case, they have to look back at how the state um, resolves that issue to find those important elements. The rationale behind this, of course, is that the states have a right to set up, uh, because their right to um, police 
in their state, the right to set up, you know, the rules as they see uh, appropriate, and that so long as what they do is not in violation of the federal law, then they're free to make those determinations. In other words, to define things in a way that they uh, see fit. Now, why is that? Because the cultures in the various states change. And the idea here is, in a free society, that where you can leave a state and go to another, that you have a right to keep um, sort of the uh, ethical and structural elements of that particular state or, or part of that state um, intact. So states should be allowed to make these decisions for themselves. And if you've read this, you know that the court's going to come down on the side of the state, which if you juxtapose this against another uh, case we're going to look at dealing with gay marriage, uh, the court makes a determination that, well, this really goes beyond the states because there is a violation of certain fundamental constitutional principles. So any decision a state makes that may be consistent with their culture and the like doesn't pass muster with the federal government because in pursuing their own state objectives uh, as they, you know, and based on how they define, for example, gay marriage uh, and its place in the system, whether or not it constitutes a marriage or not, that those things, once they step uh, and beyond the state and uh, impact, you know, rights and the like that are set up in the Constitution, they now become federal issues. In this case, what the court is going to decide is that the state has a right to set up their standards. Uh, and so long as those standards do not violate principles uh, under the Constitution of the United States, that the states are free to act in the way they would like to act. Now, the purpose of having you read this is to see how important words are um, and how the court makes determinations about state actions, right? If the state does not run afoul of the federal rule or law, then they are free uh, to act in a reasonable way, um, consistent with other state law that they've developed, uh, and the Supreme Court's going to be okay with that. So one of the questions the court wants to know the answer to is, how do you define if someone's mentally retarded? And what's behind that question, of course, is, is that a reasonable standard? And deciding that it is a reasonable standard and that the decision of the Louisiana court does not run afoul of any federal uh, protection rule and the like, that Louisiana is uh, clear to and has a right to execute that person. So how would you prepare such a reading um, so uh, if questions are asked about that reading uh, on the final exam, you'd be able to effectively uh, you know, answer those questions. In other words, get them correct. Well, first of all, you need to know uh, what the case was about. You need to know the fundamental argument being made, and you need to know the critical um, structure that's being used to determine the case. And here, it's clearly Louisiana, the court of Louisiana, not running afoul of federal rule and, or constitutional uh, principles, and it's also having a clear, uh, consistent way in which they go ahead and define uh, what's, that's, what's critical here, which is mental retardation. Knowing those uh, aspects of the case, you're well positioned to answer any question that might be asked provided, of course, you remember the name of the case, um, you're well positioned to answer any question that's asked. So there might be two or three questions, for example, on that particular case. Now, that case does not appear um, in, in brief necessarily. It, it actually is at least not the kinds of case briefs where you get a one-page synopsis of the case. You have to read through it. So how do you read through it picking out the important information? Well, the case is there for a reason. What is the case about? In this instance, it's about mental retardation. Um, and what is of concern is whether or not you can go ahead and you can execute a mentally retarded person. Well, that then leads us to the question, is this person mentally retarded? Which then leads to, well, how do we define that? And the state has to demonstrate how they define it. So if the definition is accepted by the court, seems reasonable, 
Um, and they've demonstrated that it's not run afoul of any federal law uh, or the Constitution, then they're free to execute that, that person. Now, we may think that's unfair. We may think that, well, an IQ of 72 is close enough to 70, or that there are other particulars involved here um, that, you know, should be uh, weighed. And in fact, there are. But we're not interested in those because we're interested in the fundamental question, which is, um, you know, for our purposes, maybe even not for the case, but what is this case about? What are the important principles here? Um, and what does the court sort of, uh, not sort of, what does the court decide? That's what we're looking at. Now, when you look at a case brief, on the other hand, you get all those elements um, laid out for you, literally broken down into issue, facts, and all that. Now, when you look at another case, you see the oral arguments, um, you know, before the court, the Supreme Court, <clears throat> excuse me, you get to hear uh, the way in which the court asks questions, what the court is interested in, in understanding, uh, you know, from each side, and the court already having made up its mind typically. That is to say that the justices, in listening to the oral arguments, are not hearing these arguments for the first time. They've read all the briefs, they're familiar with the, 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 you know, the issue, and they're only asking questions to clarify perhaps in their own minds a particular point or give one side or the other an opportunity to address something that they think is important and, uh, <clears throat> and that either side has a right to address and perhaps persuade the court. Okay, so in the particular case that we're interested in looking at as an example of this, again, you have, um, <clears throat> you have um, a constitutional question in this case about the 14th Amendment. And fundamentally, this is the question. Does the 14th Amendment require a state to recognize a marriage between two people of the same sex when their marriage was lawfully licensed and performed out of state? Now, this is an interesting uh, case because I think, uh, you know, a lot of people that, this is the Obergefell case, right? A lot of people, uh, <clears throat> sorry, a lot of people think that uh, the court made a determination about, you know, uh, whether gays should be allowed to be married or not. But there's an element here, which is um, states, if, and I hate to make such a mundane uh, comparison, but if you get a driver's license, for example, in New York State, you're allowed to drive in New Jersey. Right? You're not limited. So the question is, on a much more important level, obviously, if you are um, married uh, in one state, you know, even though you are of the same sex and you're married in one state, must that marriage be recognized by a, a different state, a state you know, that you move into? Okay? Um, must that be recognized? And if it... Uh, Okay, and finally, um, we're going to be looking at the case of uh, Maida versus Lynch. Here, uh, the idea is uh, appellate jurisdiction and whether Congress, you know, allows the courts of appeal to review the denial of a motion to reopen a case. In other words, there's a point at which, you know, a statute of limitations has kicked in, and the question here becomes, well, Suppose you don't find out that there was a problem uh, until the statute of limitations had already run out. In other words, let's say I walk into a store and um, I smell something that they give me and say, here, doesn't it smell wonderful? And I inhale and I say, oh, it smells nice. Um, and then, you know, 91 days later, I find out that there was a chemical uh, and the owner knew about that chemical and knew that there'd be a delayed effect and it causes me uh, brain damage, let's say. Um, several more days after that, um, you know, uh, the determination is made that it was caused by this particular um, plant or, or whatever it was. All right, well, should uh, I not be allowed to bring that suit because the uh, period right, uh, for bringing that suit has already passed because the incident happened n more than 90 days before. And so the question here is, okay, well, uh, 
putting that statute of limitations on things presumes that you know uh, when something happens. You know, often, you know, symptoms or, you know, consequences of an event may not, uh, you know, show themselves until after the period uh, given for bringing such complaints. Okay? Suppose your accountant steals from you and you have, you know, six months or a year even uh, to bring charges and you don't find out about it for two years. Can you still bring charges? And that's actually a complicated, um, you know, example for a number of reasons that we don't need to know about or discuss here. But what is important, okay, is this is the question in this case. And so really think about your right to bring a case against someone else for some harm they've done you and the state's right to say, well, we're going to limit such cases because there are practical matters here. You don't want cases to go on forever. You don't want um, people to be able to bring suits 20 years later for any number of reasons, not the least of which is that evidence um, and, you know, firsthand knowledge of that particular instance is long gone. So you're, you're sort of trying to piece things together. And it's difficult to defend yourself against something that someone claims you did or happened a very long time ago. And there are a host of other reasons. Okay, so what do I expect you to get from something like this? The fact that there are limitations on people's rights to uh, bring suit, and states have a right to set a reasonable limitation on that. And the question here is, what if you don't know? You know, um, can the state still limit that? That's one of the important questions. So you would need to know that in this particular case, the question is, you know, whether or not um, it's acceptable, appropriate, what have you, to go past the time that's been allotted for these sorts of cases to be brought to court, um, whether or not it's okay for the court to reopen that or whether you have a right to ask the court to reopen it and the like. All right, so we talk about crime, justice, uh, and politics and all of that. How, do all, how does all this fit in? I don't want you to be uh, one-dimensional around this because, you know, in terms of looking only at you know, criminal acts, that there are any number of crimes that, uh, you know, violate the law and are not what people think of as criminal acts when in fact they are. But the much larger and important focus here is that you're able to look at the reasoning, and, you know, behind the way we look at uh, particular facts, cases, that you're able to see that and you're able to understand the rationale you know, the reasonable way in which these um, sorts of decisions, you know, court decisions are made, uh, that there's a consistency, and get a sense of, okay, here's how the court views fairness. Now, we're not even beginning to get into issues of, you know, things we've already talked about in other lectures, especially, you know, the police involvement and that sort of thing. Nevertheless, what these readings are supposed to do, hopefully, is give you a much broader sense, give you a much broader sense of how the system works. Whether we're talking about someone who murdered someone, someone who um, suffered some ill and wants it reviewed, but the courts are saying, well, no, you, you've passed the point at which you can bring this case and how that gets dealt with. Um, you know, so the point here is, you know, right up to, by the way, you know, gay marriage, whether states have to recognize it uh, or not, you know, and the court decides, well, yes, of course, certain social issues come up. One of the, one of the um, you know, the lower court says these are not decisions, you know, about whether gays should be able to marry or not. That should be made by the courts, but sort of in the political arena. And, of course, the Supreme Court says, no, th this is not about, you know, the political arena. This is about fundamental constitutional principles and whether or not people are being denied their rights. Um, and, of course, the, so the court decides yes. All right. The way to prepare for the test is to know how the court reasons, what those important issues are, right, um, and the particulars, right, the facts, the issue at hand. I'm not expecting you to be legal scholars here, but I am expecting you to at least be able to address um, and speak to the critical elements of each of the readings. You know, what the reading's about, 
uh, what the principles are, you know, if, if it involves a case, with the author, if it's an, uh, an academic article, article rather, is um, trying to say or is stating and its importance. So you don't need to know every bit of minutiae. You, that, that's not what it's about. Do you understand the fundamentals here? That's what you need to focus on. You know, the broader issues and the particulars that are very clear and are um, important as part of the overall argument being made, whether it's in an academic article or whether it's uh, in the courts. So the focus is reading these readings and getting that information out of them. Now, you can look at your notes and you can look at those readings while taking the exam, and I recommend you do. But not knowing uh, that fundamental information is going to make it impossible for you to complete the exam in the time allotted if you don't know what you're looking for and have really no sense of you know, what, what particular reading you might find the answer in. So my recommendation is do the readings um, and do a summary page for yourself. You know, I wouldn't highlight because you're crazy trying to get through all these pages and that's going to be problematic because um, it's a time test. So I would emphasize you know, reading, getting the particulars out, writing them down for yourself, so that when the questions are asked, you have a sense of, oh, this is about that case. Let me go look at my notes on that. And you should do well. Okay, um, this lecture, again, was just to give you a feel for how you prepare for this final test um, and what you should be getting out of the readings. Again, nothing will uh, substitute for getting these readings done. So I recommend you do them, you take the notes on them, and you've got several days to accomplish that. Uh, and I think this is readily doable in that period of time. Good luck on the test.